I'm afraid the um, uh, we're, we're we're far far from out of the woods uh, when it comes to anti-Semitism in Britain. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor in chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. If there is anything Americans should have learned in the last two years, it is the importance of knowing history. While there are a number of issues about which there is deep and bitter disagreement among the contending parties in the American public square, be it race, guns, abortion, foreign policy, of all those that are the focus of the political culture war that has rent the social fabric of the nation, none are so divisive or so crucial for the future as those that revolve around how to characterize the past. The publication of the New York Times 1619 project in 2019 an error-ridden polemic that depicted the United States as a country which traced its beginnings to the introduction of African slaves into North America rather than the rebellion against Great Britain in 1776, as well as one that has remained irredeemably racist to this day, was the harbinger of many of the political fights of the following two years, as well as the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. That debate has spread from one that is specifically about the 1619 Project and the 1776 Commission, an answer to it created by former President Donald Trump, to a broader one about how to think not just about American history, but whether the only worthy subject of examination is that of race and whether to place those considerations above all others. That is where the discussion about the ideas about race and history that fall under the category of critical race theory begins. It is that argument about whether elementary and secondary schools should be incorporating the toxic doctrines about America as not merely a nation with a flawed, though glorious past, but as an irredeemably racist country that has moved from academia to the public square and even the ballot box, as we saw last month in the Virginia gubernatorial election. Seen in that light, the writing of history in an accurate and honest manner cannot be regarded as a mere academic topic or the preserve of -of out-of-touch scholars, but the vital interest of every educated and civic-minded citizen. So who better discuss the importance of history than the man who is arguably our greatest living writer on the subject, and the author of numerous important books on a variety of historical subjects, as well as a brand new biography of, of all people, the person who is universally depicted as the villain of the American Revolution. King George III. We're going to discuss George III and the proper application of historical revisionism in the context of the great debate about American history going on in this country, but also other topics, such as British anti-Semitism, with the author of this fascinating and, I think, important new book. Andrew Roberts is the best-selling author of such books as Churchill, Walking with Destiny, Leadership in War, The Storm of War, A New History of the Second World War, Masters and Commanders, How Four Titans Won the War in the West, Napoleon, A Life, and most recently, The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of King George III. He's the winner of numerous prizes for the writing of books about history, a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and a visiting professor at King's College London. Andrew Roberts, welcome to Top Story. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jonathan. It's very nice to be on the show. Well, thank you. It's a big thrill for me. I'm a big fan of your of your books. And the first, and I suppose most obvious question, is to ask you after your two most recent biographies, whose subjects, Napoleon and Churchill, were among the most consequential figures in hi- modern history, what impelled you to take up the study of someone who is so widely reviled, as well as not generally considered all that important to the lives of contemporary readers as George III? <laughs> Well, I, I think that that would be a very strange thing for an American to believe that the king who was their last king and uh, obviously was uh, on the throne when America had its uh, independence and uh, war of independence and its revolution is unimportant to uh, to mod- the lives of modern Americans. I, I take issue with you over that. I think that he's a, he's a pretty central figure, uh, frankly, in the history, probably more in the history of your country than the history of mine. Mm-hmm. Well, you've, I've heard you say that just about everything we know about George III 
is wrong? What are the principal things that everybody knows about George III that are that is wrong? Um, well, the first one that uh, he had porphyria, this uh, physiological illness. It wasn't that at all. Um, that comes from a complete misdiagnosis back in the 1960s on the basis of uh, misleading symptoms. In fact, he had manic depression and uh, it's a uh, entirely different kind of illness. Uh, we also um, think that we know that it was his obstinacy and his madness that led to the defeat in the American War of Independence and the American Revolution and so on, so, which also is completely wrong. Um, he didn't have any um, attacks of, uh, of mental illness in that period. And also, uh, he wasn't obstinate. He was a constitutional monarch who went along uh, very largely with his cabinet and his uh, government. And... Um, and so he ultimately, I don't believe, can be blamed for the American Revolution, which I think was pretty inevitable by the 1770s anyway, and uh, and it was going to happen. The last thing, and the third thing, is that he wasn't a tyrant, as he was made out to be in the um, Declaration of Independence, and of course in the musical, um, the Lin-Manuel Miranda <laughs> musical, uh, Hamilton, an American musical. He was nothing like that uh, kind of figure at all. He was actually an enlightened uh, monarch, in many ways a Renaissance prince. Yeah, I think anybody who reads the book finds out so much detail about him that is um, very attractive. I mean, he seems like a, 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 nice, a good family man and uh, someone who uh, really understands um, so much about the world in which he lived um, and sort of very educated. Um, uh, yours is, I think, obviously a fairly sympathetic, a fair-minded portrait of the last king of America. But how does a scrupulous biographer avoid the pitfall of uh, falling in love, so to speak, with his subjects? How easy or difficult is it to lose perspective when you spend literally a couple of years of your life taking a deep dive into the life of an individual, especially someone about whom there is so much detail available to the historian? And in this case, where, um, as you've told us, thanks to the current monarch, you were able to uncover material that had never previously been available to scholars. Well, I think that's the key, isn't it? It's to try to um, find the uh, the first hand evidence, the um, primary sources, and to then follow your nose after that. It's uh, I was very fortunate, as you mentioned, that the Queen has put a hundred thousand pages of uh, of documents, of uh, diaries and memoranda and uh, correspondence and so on of King George the Third's uh, private um, correspondence online. And uh, and so I think from that, we can see a very different picture from the one that two centuries of historians, especially the weak historians who are ideologically opposed to him, um, have come up with with regard to uh, George III. And, uh, and to answer your question about how you, how do you stop yourself from falling in love with uh, your subject, and especially when with Napoleon, I spent six years in his, uh, in his company, and one very much gets the sense of um, of him trying to seduce um, historians and biographers even centuries after his death, uh, he was he was very um, much a sort of uh, adept curator of his own myth. Uh, but you have to try and see through all that, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, for those who read um, the Last King of America, um, among the many things, even if you think you know about this period, there's so much there that is is new. Uh, including um, an early bout of uh, manic depression that you speak of, um, you know, in, early in his reign that had perhaps not been previously understood. And also the way uh, that, um, you know, the, the, the lead up to the, uh, to the revolution in which he certainly has opinions about what, uh, what should happen in the colonies. But I think you make a very good good case, um, and you speak of, you know, Whig and Tory historians, that as a constitutional monarch, um, the one thing that he didn't do was to override his ministers, which is, in essence, I guess what the, the colonists wanted him to do. Yes, they did. They asked him to become a, uh, a tyrant, essentially. It's essentially to become a steward, which is, was the whole point of the, the Hanoverian uh, uh, reign to, uh, to, to not be a steward. That's right. They, they, by clothing themselves in the mantle of the 1642 revolution against Charles I and the 1688 revolution against James II, they had to essentially 
make him out to be a Stuart absolutist, somebody who believed in the divine right of kings and so on, which of course he wasn't. He was a Hanoverian who came, uh, the Hanoverians only came to the throne because of the 1688 revolution against the Stuart absolutists. So uh, he was somebody, in fact, who revered the uh, British constitution uh, and, uh, and appreciated the limits that it placed on his power. Only once in his whole reign, the longest reign of any king of England, nearly 60 years long, did he um, choose a prime minister who didn't have the support of the majority of the House of Commons. And on that occasion, he installed the 24-year-old William Pitt the Younger, who subsequently won a landslide victory in the general election, vindicating the king's uh, choice of him. Yeah, that, that, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, I think um, it sort of shows how the, the British constitutional system works. Um, in your book, uh, among other things, you take a very hard look at the Declaration of Independence and attempt to draw a distinction between its preamble, which even today in a time of great historical ignorance, most Americans learn at least a phrase or two, and the rest of it, um, not as well known, which made a more detailed argument for the revolution. Can you tell us uh, a bit more about that and about uh, what you think about the indictment of George III? Well, the preamble, the first uh, third of it, of course, uh, makes you proud to be human. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of, of Shakespearean sublime prose that, uh, that is uh, wonderful and, and for the ages. Uh, and it's a very good thing for your country, um, indeed lots of countries, to uh, try to promote uh, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, for example. However, then after that, you've got the next two thirds, which constitutes a 28 um, charges against George III, very ad hominem personal attack on him, uh, accusing him of doing all sorts of things that he simply was not guilty of. There are ex post facto rationalizations there, there are accusations against him for simply doing the same thing that other um, British um, leaders like Oliver Cromwell and, and Elizabeth I and, and the Stuarts and so on have been doing in America for 150 years. There are some things that he's accused of that he simply didn't do, like um, the, the one about, uh, about taking people over the oceans for trial. He never took anybody over any ocean for trial. But there are two. The 17th, which is regarding the uh, taxation of Americans, and the 22nd, which regards... Um, Parliament's veto rights over American legislation, which in and of themselves justify the American Revolution. Yeah, that, that's the main thing. Uh, only two of the 27 counts stick, but I, I think you make, uh, you, you acknowledge that that would be enough to justify the revolution. Um, I, I was also very interested in, um, in the book where you d discuss the differences between uh, life in colonial America and in Britain where uh, you say about how, how uh, you know, America was really ripe for independence because it w was largely self-governing at this point, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And um, uh, of course, you had royal governors who had veto rights, but they very, very rarely ever used them. Essentially, it was the legislatures um, uh, made up of Americans who, um, who made the laws for America. And... Uh, and by the 1770s, you know, the Americans, uh, you had 2.5 million population, you had a burgeoning economy, you had as many bookshops in Philadelphia as in any other city of the whole empire apart from London. And you had no outside threat after 1763, the Treaty of Paris from the French, who had been expelled from the uh, North American continent and the nearest French army was a thousand miles away in Haiti. So it was the correct moment of historical development for the 13 colonies to become independent. But that doesn't make George III a tyrant. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's quite right. Um, I think the life of this, as you rightly say, widely misunderstood uh, historical figure illustrates how easy it is for popular culture to establish a narrative or narratives about history that people blindly accept. <laughs> I think many of those who may see Hamilton uh, may wonder about what we should think about the depictions of people like Washington or Jefferson in the play, but probably few were questioning showing George III as a maniacal despot. Pop culture, whether it's a highbrow play about, uh, or movie about history like The Madness of King George, which, as you've already told us, uh, stoked the myth about Porphyria, as, a, as opposed to, say, the more lowbrow Netflix hit Pridgerton, 
which apparently <laughs> convinced most of its audiences to accept the astonishing claim that Queen George's wife, Queen Charlotte, was a woman of color, has far more traction than even the most widely read book, which is Grounded in the Truth. Do you find the ability of such myths to prevail in the wider culture frustrating, or is this just something people who care about history uh, have to learn to, to accept? We very much have to learn to accept. And, and actually, of course, it's tremendously helpful for for uh, a serious history book uh, like my biography of George III, that there are such uh, depictions in Bridgerton and uh, mm. and Hamilton the musical, because otherwise nobody would have heard of George III at all in in popular culture. So, mm -hmm. uh, so no, I'm 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 happy just so long as people don't um, regard, for example, The Crown, the TV um, documentary, uh, mm -hmm. TV um, entertainment series, The Crown, docu as being in yeah. e exactly in any way. Um, uh, representative of the actual truth, you know, that, that is not history, uh, that is uh, infotainment or entertainment. And uh, But I think people are, are very obviously, you know, clever enough to be able to tell the difference. I really do. Um, I think they do with respect to Bridgerton. I'm not so sure about the crown, just between the two of us. I, well, I, I mean, a friend, a friend of mine found 1,000 factual errors in the first series of the crown. Um, so uh, I jolly well hope Americans do recognize that it is not a documentary. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, um, I, I saw a comedian doing a, a, a two-minute summary of the fourth season um, in which he referred to... Uh, the, the supposed conversation between the person who broke into Buckingham Palace and, and Queen Elizabeth as the most the most moving fictional conversation I've ever had. You know, so, <laughs> so I think your 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 book stands on its own as it should as a great work of, of scholarship and interest. Thank you. But unlike the last biography of George III, which as it turns out was published nearly a half century ago, yours has come out at a moment when Americans are, ironically, uh, sort of figuratively up in arms about how to tell the story of the revolution and its meaning with respect to whether they should take pride in their country's birth or regard it as being born in sin as a result of the sin of slavery and remaining as an irredeemably racist nation to this day, as the New York Times 1619 project seems to assert. While I don't think learning the truth about slavery or that George III wasn't a tyrant should change our minds about the nobility or even the necessity of the American Revolution, I'm wondering what you think about how this impacts any discussion about your own far more modest and far more rooted in historical fact attempt to correct the historical record when comparing to such sweeping revisionism. And before you respond to that, I want to share with you something written by an earlier British historian about the uh, question of the meaning of revising the record about the revolution. C.E. Carrington, author of The British Overseas, a book that was required reading in a course on the history of the British Empire that I took at Columbia University sometime during the last Ice Age, shared your views <laughs> about the Declaration and what he thought was a shabby case about both George and British rule in North America. Uh, he wrote the following. Um, whatever the profound historians may demonstrate in their works of learning, the people of America will continue to be nourished upon the anti-British tirades of the Declaration of Independence and the allusions to the glorious escape from the jaws of the tyrant king. This is, however, he went on to write, not a sentimental trifle. It is the deeply rooted, almost instinctive foundation of the American national character, which must be appreciated if America is to be understood that their own historians should have proved the legend of the downtrodden colonists and the wicked King George III to be a fable is a matter of very slight importance. What matters is that the Americans believe themselves to have come into existence fighting for liberty, no unworthy faith, and in that faith they stand for liberty today. And I think we should note that he wrote those words only a few years after 1.5 million Americans crossed the Atlantic Ocean in the opposite direction from the troops that were sent by King George's ministers to suppress the revolution to help defend the liberty of Britain and the existence of Western civilization against Nazi barbarism. And I guess the question is, if a new generation of Americans is educated to believe a different myth about America, um, is there any possibility that they would do anything like that again or even defend their own liberty at home? Oh, I think so. No, I think if anything, my book shows the exceptionalism of America um, because it, uh, you know, there are any number of people throughout history who have escaped oppression uh, and found uh, sovereignty. The Israelites escaping from the Egyptians, the um, 
Dutch against the Spanish, the Greeks against the Turks and so on, the Italians against the Austrians. But what America did was truly exceptional, which was to overthrow uh, a um, non-oppressive regime in order to take its its independence and sovereignty uh, and uh, and to revolt against a, a king who was not a tyrant. I think that's truly exceptional and, and completely different. And you mentioned earlier about the founding fathers, you know, the sheer courage that it took for the founding fathers to uh, to fight against the most powerful empire in the world, and also then the genius of the founding fathers to come up with a constitution that has bound America, this extraordinary uh, continent so different in so many ways, into one political entity for a quarter of a millennium, is a truly extraordinary experience and uh, and achievement, and um, and ought to be celebrated as such. Yes. Um... Carrington, whose book I just uh, quoted from, uh, goes on later um, to note that the mud originally thrown by Jefferson still sticks to Britain, but that there is nevertheless a monument to George Washington in London's Trafalgar Square, but that there was little likelihood of Americans erecting one to George III in the foreseeable future. Um, <laughs> of course, we're living in a time when Americans, and indeed, you know, um, even Britons, are tearing down statues of their own heroes in here, uh, like Jefferson. And in Britain, we're seeing something of the same with attacks on Winston Churchill. You've taken up the fight against that particular brand of toxic revisionism. Can you tell us a little bit about that and which side you think is winning in the fight to defend the British past and what that means for Britain's future? Um, well, thank you uh, for those kind words. Yes, I. Um, uh, Winston Churchill very much is in the front line of the culture wars in, in Britain. Um, he wouldn't have minded that. He was in the front line of every war uh, that he came across um, right. at, uh, again and again uh, throughout his life. So, um, so he'd have been comfortable there. But uh, it's true, the uh, statue of Winston Churchill tends to be attacked uh, in some way or another or vandalised in the big uh, demonstrations that take place in the uh, centre of our capital city. Um, I think that um, when you ask who's winning, essentially, I think that at the moment, the uh, people who want to uh, daub and destroy and pull down statues are winning, but that's simply because local people are not given a say. Whenever local people are given a say, and we saw this quite recently in uh, in Sheffield, that um, actually they, they like their statues. They want to, uh, when they're given a vote, they always vote to keep them. They... Um, aren't often given a vote because the um, the um, revisionists want to uh, to pull these statues down or to remove them and take them to museums and things. Whereas ordinary people actually are perfectly intelligent enough to realise that not everybody in the past thought the same way as people who live in the present. And, um, uh, and the idea of somebody having to be absolutely perfect in every part of their lives before a statue can go up to them is also a, a, an absurdity. So I think that the more referenda that take place, the more that ordinary people are um, asked about these things, um, the more statues will, will stay up because they see people see it as, as part of their, of their um, uh, community. Well, I think you know that's a, that's actually reflected, I think, in the reality here in the United States because um, the statues have been taken down, usually not by popular acclaim. Um, just recently, the New York City Council removed a, a statue of Thomas Jefferson that has stood there, you know, for for over a century. Um, and in other cases, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was removed from in front of uh, its iconic place in front of the Museum of Natural History. Um, but, you know, in, in Virginia, we saw an election which seemed to hinge on a debate about um, how we think about history. And in that case, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the revisionists clearly lost. Um, so I guess that, that's the thing, how to make it, how to, to um, sort of uh, transition this from a debate between elites in which sort of the, the hard left and the uh, seems, seems to always prevail uh, in, in the name of some new idea of political correctness. But when it, it does get to uh, a more general vote, um, uh, sort of the icons seem to, to stay up. I agree. Yes, absolutely. The, um, uh, the woke crowd don't have the votes, um, and that's why it should be put to the vote uh, as, as often as possible. Yeah. Um, 
I just want to, you know, get back to George III. I mean, of all of the things that you learned about him, and I tell you, as someone who has read your book, I mean, the list of things I, you know, I thought I knew a lot about the subject. In fact, you know, I, I found I knew very little about him. What was the most striking um, for you as, as sort of as the author that surprised you or in some way sort of even, you know, sort of made you think, wow, I, I don't know, th- I didn't know this man at all? Um, I think two things. The the first was um, the essays that he wrote when Prince of Wales in the 1750s, especially the one he wrote on uh, Montesquieu's uh, essays on the laws, in which he takes to pieces the arguments in favour of slavery. Uh, and um, and he writes very eloquently about how, how uh, utterly you know, ludicrous and absurd these pro-slavery arguments are. This is a man who never bought or sold a slave in his life, who never... Uh, invested in any of the com- uh, companies that did that, who signed the legislation that abolished the slave trade, of course, and yet for 200 years has been seen as somehow morally inferior to the signatures of the Declaration of Independence, 41 out of 56 of whom did own slaves. That surprised me. And the other thing that surprised me um, was that uh, some of the um, delegates to the Stamp Act Congress were actually told if um, Britain was to offer representation in Parliament to Americans, um, to refuse it. So the cry, no taxation without representation, uh, which was so powerful in the American Revolution, actually was predicated by people who were going to refuse to offer, uh, to accept representation were it offered. And I think that also was quite a surprise when I read that. Well, um, I think that that's, that's fascinating. And I think it's also anybody who knows the history of Great Britain knows that when Ireland um, and Scotland were incorporated into, into the Union um, and were offered seats in, you know, and got seats in, in the Parliament in Westminster, that did not do anything for, for home rule or, uh, you know, to, to enhance their ability to govern themselves. Quite the opposite. Wasn't that the case? Well, um, not so much in Scotland, but certainly uh, the when they were given the Irish were given a hundred seats in eighteen o one, and they did stay there until nineteen twenty two. So you know, one hundred and twenty one years is is um, not an inconsiderable amount of time in the history of a nation. Yeah, and um, of course, once um, there was um, everybody in Ireland was allowed to, at least you know uh, adult males were allowed to vote. Um, there's this huge faction in the British Parliament that wants independence or wants home rule, but can't really get it. Yes, it's, I mean, it's an, a, a Catholic um, nationalist vote, mm-hmm. essentially, um, because some 90% of uh, Irishmen at that time were Catholic. And, uh, of course, it was um, when they actually um, joined the Union in 1801, uh, Catholics didn't have the vote. So mm-hmm. it became a very um, uh, contentious issue, needless to say, and then uh, finally, when they did get the vote, they, they tended to vote uh, overwhelmingly nationalist. So it created a sort of a group of um, 80 or 90 um, Irish MPs who tended to vote on the left against, uh, against unionist governments. Yeah. And so the, the point being that even if, you know, somehow, you know, so, somehow um, America had been offered uh, representation in Parliament in the 1770s, it wouldn't necessarily have gotten anyone in America what they wanted. No, that's right. I mean, it could well you could well have gone down the uh, the Irish route. However, having said that, if uh, um, if America had stayed part of the um, of the wider English speaking um, entity up until 1922, there is simply no way, like the Irish did, there's simply no way that the Kaiser would have invaded Belgium. He couldn't possibly have first started the First World War. With no, no First World War, you don't have any Bolshevism, you don't have any Nazism, you don't have the Holocaust. I think the world would have been an absolutely much happier place. Now that's an interesting counterfactual. And, you know, you, you edited a book of, of what-if scenarios <laughs> at one point. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that was in there. I don't remember. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't, but it ought to have been. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Although, of course, there are those who would argue that uh, had there been no independent United States taking its you know, place on the global stage, that might have not necessarily you know, worked to the advantage of the West. But I guess you're arguing the contrary. I think so. Yes, I, I, the, uh, the United States, what became the United States and the British Empire together 
uh, in 1914, which is the crucial year of modern history, in my view, uh, I think makes the, the world a, a much uh, happier place. Well, okay. Well, I think that's a that's a that's a, that's a very British point of view. I think the only and I, and I think it's somewhat convincing. And I'll just just digress for a moment before we get to the next question. But sort of one of the main points of contention between uh, the Americans and and certainly the British government was expansion to the West. And so, if you know, if America remains within the British Empire, would America have become sort of this global? You know this this continental, you know, colossus oh, that the way that it no. did. No, you definitely you can't have the Halifax um, Proclamation of October 1763 preventing the Americans, uh, the American colonists, from um, from moving westwards over the Alleghenies. Obviously, though, that uh, plan of the kings essentially to uh, reserve the whole of the American continent to a gigantic Native American reservation was something that. Uh, that uh, clearly um, American colonists could not put up with. And many of them, people like Henry Lee and uh, and George Washington, lost a great fortune because they were speculating in, in land in the mm-hmm. uh, Ohio Valley and the Mississippi uh, Valley and so on. Right. Well, that's a counterfactual we can't, uh, we can't resolve. <laughs> um, in the time we have left, I want to switch topics a bit and ask you um, about both attitudes towards Israel currently in the United Kingdom, as well as the struggle against anti-Semitism there. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the immediate past head of the Labour Party and the leader of the opposition in the House of Commons, was, in the opinion of most British Jews, an anti-Semite and someone who helped incite hatred against both Israel and the Jews, um, though he's been replaced uh, by a seemingly more friendly figure towards uh, Jews and the head uh, of the Labour Party in uh, Keith Starmer. Do you think this indicates that anti-Semitism is on the wane in Britain, or is it thanks to the influence of uh, less with the least and that of the Muslim community, that hostility towards Israel that is legitimizing this hate is still very much a problem? So very much a problem, and I would argue a growing problem. I mean, just because we managed to, or at least the Labour Party managed to get rid of um, an anti-Semite, a, an obvious and essentially avowed um, a person who, uh, who believed that uh, Jews didn't understand English irony, for example, uh, who uh, um, who um, put wreaths on the graves of Palestinian terrorists uh, and then lied about it later, who um, defended grossly anti-Semitic um, uh, paintings and, and pictures on the side of houses. It was a truly terrible and dangerous time, December um, uh, 2019, uh, where this, uh, this man nonetheless garnered millions upon millions of, of votes. Um, he lost the election, of course, and I think anti-Semitism did play an important part in that. But nonetheless, the idea that uh, so many millions of people could still have voted Labour, despite all of the things that he'd said and, and, and done about the Jews, is a very worrying thing. Since then, we've had increases in attacks on Jews, in um, attacks on synagogues. We've had um, a, uh, a, a series of, um, of sort of d- essentially... Um, uh, rearguard actions by the Corbynite Labour Party. Um, you're right that Keir Starmer is a much, much better figure. He is not an anti-Semite. He doesn't have any of those uh, loathsome, um, the sort of bacillus of anti-Semitism is, is not part of his political makeup at all. Um, but he's he hasn't sort of essentially yet pulled it off. He's uh, He still has a, a large body of detractors. And... Um, uh, and he could well be overthrown by the Labour Party anyhow before the next election because he isn't really making very much traction, um, except for yeah, the, I mean, the I, last I, two weeks. Uh, I think what people Boris don't Johnson. understand is that um, you know Corbyn was challenged by other members of Parliament in the Labour Party who saw him as you know an outlier and, and a dangerous extremist. Mm. But every time he went to the Labour Party, you know, um, voters, Com- Corbyn yeah. won. Um, yeah, and the conference cheered him and, and gave him standing ovations and so on. Um, that said, he has been expelled from the uh, Labour Party at the moment. He's not a uh, he's not a um, active um, you know whipped member of the uh, of the Labour Party. So uh, so they have at least that. Although there's enormous pressure to try and bring him back. Um, but I think in the wider uh, sphere, we saw just the other day the Israeli ambassador being attacked. 
uh, the London School of Economics um, and, uh, and screamed at and shouted down and people throwing things and attacking her car and so on. You know, uh, I'm afraid the, um, uh, we're, we're, we're far, far from out of the woods um, when it comes to anti-Semitism in Britain. Um, where do you think this comes from? I know in your in your book on Churchill, and I've heard you lecture on, on Churchill and the Jews, you, you were able to sort of explain what made, you know, one of the things that made Churchill able to understand the Nazi threat was that he was uh, perhaps uniquely or almost uniquely among the British political elite of his time, someone who was not an anti-Semite. Um, no. Where is this coming from? What is what is driving uh, this this kind of hate, which has really gone mainstream, as you say? Um, well, it's always been there. Uh, I'm afraid it's it's actually um, almost totally dead in the Conservative Party, which is a positive thing. Since Margaret Thatcher um, and her philo Semite um, assumptions really took over the Tory Party back in the uh, 1980s. Um, uh, anti-Semitism has essentially been expunged from the Conservative Party completely. I, I certainly have never come across any of it. So it's a, uh, um, so that's one of the pleasing aspects of uh, of it. So although it's true of one political party, it's con- it's not around any longer in another. But you know, it's the oldest hatred. It's always there, mm-hmm. bubbling under the surface. And w- what you have to do is constantly uh, bear down on it through education, of course, primarily is the is the best uh, way of going about it and teaching children properly, um, which I'm not sure is always happening. You know, the, the hard left have taken over large areas of the British educational establishment, frankly. Um, I think that we don't uh, bear down on it anything like enough in our um, uh, newspapers and, and media. And then there is Twitter, which frankly is the uh, what my friend Neil Ferguson calls the universal lavatory wall. Um, it, you know, it really is a cesspit. And, uh, and anti-Semitism um, is all too often allowed to thrive there in a way that, um, and on Facebook and so on, in a way that these, um, these great uh, giant companies really have to get to grips with. Yeah. Um, you've been someone who has been actively involved in efforts to foster support for the state of Israel and Britain. Um, the current prime minister, Boris Johnson, is viewed as sympathetic to Israel and the Jewish community. But is this reflected in British policy towards the Jewish state at a time when European willingness to appease Iran and um, to support Palestinian um, sort of NGOs and intransigence appears to still be quite strong? Yes, no, it certainly is. And um, and thanks for mentioning uh, that about my work for something called the Friends of Israel Initiative. If I could just give a shout out to uh, 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 for that, the Friends of Israel Initiative, which is of uh, non-Jews like me, uh, who believe that Israel should not be held to a diff- completely different standard of uh, of practice than any other country in the region and, uh, and most of the other countries in the world. I think that... Um, our problem, really, although, of course, as you say, uh, uh, Boris Johnson is a philo uh, nonetheless, the Foreign Office seemed to be in complete control of um, and foreign policy still, uh, regardless of who is Prime Minister or indeed Foreign Secretary. They still keep on this, um, this line that... Um, uh, that Iran shouldn't be seen as a uh, as an enemy, which is the most extraordinary, considering the behaviour of Iran um, since mm. 1979 and beyond. But certainly, and behaviour towards Britain as well as America um, and, and its and its um, its behaviour towards us. Exactly the fact that it uh, it captured some Royal Marines and held them essentially as hostages uh, only a few years ago. The um, the saber rattling that it does against our friends in the region as well, uh, and of course centrally the fact that it is still got. Um, uh, a nuclear um, ambition and a nuclear program. You know, this is something that I'm afraid the um, the British Foreign Office will not um, go down the proper route and uh, um, and and oppose tooth and nail and do everything possible to prevent the um, horrific day that might dawn when a um, avowedly anti-Semitic uh, Iran. Um, actually gets the bomb. Yes. Um, I think it's interesting. Obviously, Britain's political system, its government works a bit differently from ours here in the United States with sort of the permanent civil servants, uh, 
Um, you know, so anybody who watched Yes Minister <laughs> knows that the civil servants have a bit more autonomy and, and run, um, you know, the ministries in a slightly different way than, say, the deep state, as some people call it here in the United States, operates. Um, but um, I think there was one instance recently where um, Prime Minister Johnson seemed to intervene and to order um, British diplomats not to vote, not to continue voting against Israel in, uh, in UN forums. Um, is, is that a sign that perhaps there is some hope that this government um, is willing to take this issue serious and really to sort of make what is obviously a very difficult effort to force the bureaucracy to do the will of the, uh, you know, the elected uh, leadership? Yes, it is. It's a good sign. And the, and the fact that we've got a new foreign secretary uh, in Liz Truss is a good sign because she is uh, positive towards Israel. But so was her predecessor, Dominic Raab. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these individuals are, um, are uh, in the Conservative Party, as I mentioned earlier, are, are pro-Israel. But um, there is a blob, as it's called in, uh, in Britain, a blob uh, of, the, um, of the civil service and the establishment and and just the general sort of state um, that does seem to be very good at, um, at thwarting the desires of elected officials in, in, in Britain. You know, I mean, for example, we voted for Brexit in June 2016. Mm -hmm. We didn't get it until January 2020. You know, the, the blob essentially uh, held up something that was the democratic will of the British people for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And thought it was right to do so and was cheered on um, by much of the media, wasn't it? Cheered on, cheered on by the Guardian newspaper, by the, um, uh, the left-wing um, press, certainly by the BBC, uh, by um, the Church of England, by um, any number of major sort of bodies and institutions, the House of Lords and so on. Um, but, um, but ultimately, you know, finally, uh, the will of the people uh, did uh, win out and um, and we got it. But uh, but as I say, if we'd had it three and a half years earlier, it might have been going a bit better for us by now. Mm. Um, just one quick last question. Um, you mentioned the influence of the media. Um, uh, how What role does it play in this uh, drama of anti-Semitism going on in Britain? Um, is it forceful enough against it or is it in some ways because of sort of negative coverage of it, unfair negative coverage of Israel, is it um, bolstering it? I, I, um, I don't think it's doing anything like enough, uh, frankly. I think it, uh, um, it allows a, um, essentially a, um, a critical view of Israel to be presented almost um, uninterrupted and uh, especially in the left-wing papers uh, where it can't, it, they couldn't even denounce unreservedly that attack on the Israeli ambassador to London. So, um, so no, things are not, are not good here yet. Um, there are some, some you know, bright uh, things on the horizon in that we do have a, a you know, pro-Israel conservative government, but it's not doing anything particularly useful for Israel at the, at the moment, you know. I mean, it's any, there are any number of um, things that it could do. And why don't we, if America's moved its, uh, moved its embassy to um, Jerusalem, why, why is ours still in Tel Aviv? What's going on there? We're supposed to be you know, part of the special relationship and part of the Anglosphere and so on. We ought to be taking a stand um, over this. But, um, but there's simply no way that the blob, the foreign office and so on, will allow that to happen. Yes, well, I, I quite agree about that, although, frankly, the, the current American government isn't that enthusiastic about what happened with Jerusalem. But uh, that's, a, that's a discussion for another day. Andrew Roberts, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and speak about George III as well as a number of other interesting subjects. You've given us so much to think about. Um, people should go out and read, get, go out and get that book, as well as other uh, books by Andrew Roberts. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you to our audience. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you uh, who have, uh, are listening to this on the various podcast platforms, Spotify, Amazon, Google, iHeartRadio, and those who are watching it on the JNS YouTube channel, or ultimately on JBS TV on your local cable network. Um, thank you. Please like. Um, give good reviews, subscribe to this podcast, and uh, we'll see you again next week.
I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.